everyone. Houses. And 
and righteousness endures forever. Even in darkness, like dawn for the upright, for those who are gracious and compassionate and righteous, good will come to those who are generous and lend freely. Who can never bear affairs with justice? Surely the righteous will never be shaken. They will all remember forever. They will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Their hearts are secure. They will have no fear. In the end, they will look in triumph upon their foes. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Their Lord will be lifted high in honor. The wicked will see and be vexed. They will gnash their teeth and raise to faith. The longings of the wicked will come to nothing. Our curie is found on page 203. Lofty words of wisdom, 
For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my proclamation were not with plausible words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest, rest on human wisdom, but on the power of God. Yet among the mature we do not speak wisdom. Though it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to perish, but we speak God's wisdom, secret and hidden, which God decreed before the ages of our for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But, as it is written, what no eyes have seen, nor, nor ear heard, nor the human heart can see, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For what human beings know what is truly human except the human spirit that was within? So also no one comprehends what is truly God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit that is from God, so that we may understand the gifts bestowed on us by God. The Word of the Lord. We stand as you are able for reading the gospel. Our gospel, according to Matthew chapter 5, beginning at the 13th verse. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus said, You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The gospel of our Lord. Last week, as our gospel message, we heard the beginning, just the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, which is an immensely long discourse Jesus gave to the most dedicated of his followers, the ones who had the determination and the stamina to follow him up a mountain overlooking the Sea of Galilee. I fortunately went there by bus. Um, and what we heard last week is known as the Beatitudes, where Jesus began by telling us about all the blessed are those, and in essence telling us what we have to look forward to, the very best part of what we have to look forward to. And then today he continues onward, and we begin hearing about what is expected from those who see those benefits. Now Jesus isn't saying that you have to do all these things before there is any payoff. I mean, this isn't a work for reward. 
rewards program here. But Jesus is pointing out that we have already benefited from being followers of Christ. And there is then, for those who recognize it, a desire to be filled with God's Spirit because we need to feel filled the places where we find emptiness in life. And Jesus is in essence saying, once you've experienced some benefit, you'll want to do something more in return. More and more. To be filled more and more with the Holy Spirit. Although, you might be asking yourselves, well, what more can we possibly do? Well, today we get the answer. Today we are told that we are to be. We are to be salt. We are to be light. And of course, Jesus doesn't mean this literally, he's talking figuratively. We are to be the salt that flavors life. The, the thing that keeps life from being bland and ordinary. Now, I don't know if you've ever had to live through a salt-free diet. If you haven't had to, this won't mean much to you. But just try going one day completely without salt. It's difficult because so many foods already have salt thrown into them. And that's because salt brings out the flavor of food and allows people to enjoy food rather than using food as just something to fill up the stomach so it's not complaining. So this is one thing we are to do, to bring flavor and joy to people's lives. That's how we are to be salt. <coughs> the other part of the job description that Jesus gives in today's lesson is that we are to be light. Now, if you've ever stumbled around in the dark during a power outage or whatever, you will know full well that in the dark, everything looks the same. That's the reason why you can't tell if there's a roller skate or toy car on the top step when you're standing at the top of the stairs and don't know what you're going to be stepping onto. Life in the dark can be rather dangerous business because more than likely, you'll bump into something. And for people who have made their lives to live in the dark, they are going about some dangerous business. As much as many people feel they've got everything under control, they are probably living amongst dangers they are totally unaware of. Now, as humans, we can live with a certain amount of danger in our lives, especially if we're aware of it, and if we've learned how to deal with it. That's why we have no problem driving automobiles at 80 to 100 kilometers an hour down the road, even though people 150 years ago might have thought we were taking our lives in our own hands driving like that. I mean, yes, still be dangerous, but these days we have learned how to minimize the danger to a point where it's usually not problematic. You could say that various engineers and experts have enlightened the pathway. They've lightened the darkness of how to drive safer, even when we're going at a high speed, and we all benefit from it, perhaps even every single day. So in that way, Jesus tells us that as light, we are not supposed to keep secret what we know about sin. Don't keep secret 
how we solve the problems of sin and the worries it brings to the world. We are to put that information out there for all to be aware of. And we do that by telling other people about it. And by showing other people how it's done. It can be difficult to admit when we were in need of forgiveness, for example. It can be difficult to admit we have done something wrong. But when we do admit, when we do ask for forgiveness, or when we forgive someone, we are showing God's light to the world. So as followers of Jesus, our job description then is to act as salt and light because we have already been seasoned and enlightened by the Holy Spirit. So now, let me ask you a question. Where do we find the salt and light in our congregation? What is God up to among us here right now? So often, when asked those kinds of questions, what is God doing? We have a tendency to look back at what once was, how things were, at our former successes and accomplishments as a congregation. You know, the days once upon a time when we had Sunday schools, loads of youth, many responding to the call for church council, that's coming up soon, by the way. And it seems like it was easy. What we often forget is that those times have come and gone. We live in a different era now. Even the place of the church congregation and society has changed. We can't go back to the so-called glory days of the 50s and 60s. I need to clarify the 1950s and 60s that a lot of people recall to truly be salt and light in this world. Now we have to move forward and to do that in a time when people don't come to us anymore for salt and light, it means that we have to move out into the community and bring it to them. And that actually has always been the job description of the Christian church. If we look back on church history as a whole, you know, you start with what we're looking at in our Zoom Bible studies or the Acts of the Apostles from the beginning then. If we look back at all that time from then till now, we find that the glory days that some of us grew up and lived in, those days were an aberration. That was normal for the Christian church. They were abnormal for the amount of support the church received from community and society when compared to the bulk of church history. But because many of us lived through those decades, or maybe even just part of them, we used those years as a measuring stick, and we thought, well, that was normal. But it wasn't normal. If you charted it, it was one of those places where the grass goes way up high before it drops off. That wasn't normal. And we need to keep that in mind in order to be able to focus on what our mission is. If we try to just reclaim those times, we're always going to fall short. And we will always see ourselves and our congregations today somehow as failures, when they are not. They are not. We are not failing. We are continuing on in a way so much of church history was. I know in our minds we often think, oh, well, you know, it used to be everybody, everybody went. No. 
They did not. In order to move ahead then, a good thing to ask ourselves might be who benefits from our Christian community. Just as salt and light do not exist for their own benefit, our local community of disciples, we don't exist for ourselves but rather to model God's reign of forgiveness and loving grace to others. That's what we exist to do. And unfortunately, when we were in that aberration of high church growth, we lost sight of that. We thought, oh well, everyone will come to us. We have to lose that attitude. We have to remember what the church knew for hundreds and even mostly thousands of years. We need to go out to others. And while our church community is an important place, an important part of all that, what we do as individuals is also important as well. We shouldn't just depend on our church community to be the salt and light for all of us. Because then we might be like the story of the man who stood under the street light with his head bowed and he was scratching away at the snow with his boot. And a friend of his comes along and asks what he's doing and he says, well, I'm looking in the snow for some change that I dropped. So his friend also begins using his boot and scratching away at the snow looking in that same pool of light from the street light. And after a while, a friend says, well, you know what? I've been looking now a while, but I don't see any change. Are you sure you dropped it here? And the first guy replies, well, as a matter of fact, I actually dropped it on the other side of the street, but the light here is so much better. <laughs> we have to go to where we are called. If we're going to be salt and light to the world, we need to uncover our lights, not just here, but out there. We need to start looking and showing others our light, flavoring others' lives with salt out in the darkness and blandness of the world as well. That's our job description. But we don't need to feel that it's up to each of us alone. This is why we gather. This is why it's important for us to gather. Because we do this together as well as alone. And we come together in this place for a purpose. We come here for support. We come here for help advice. We come here for God's guidance because in the world we can't do it alone. And there are some things we just do better when we are gathered together. We need each other in this endeavor of fulfilling our job description to be salt and light to the world. Because we already see blessings and God's favor and see the world in God's light, we have the ability to bring light and flavor to other people's lives. And we do this not by looking back to what used to be, but by moving forward to what God says we can be and become. Being salt and light is not about existing for ourselves, but for the world around us. So may that job is in each of our hearts. Amen. Let us now confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Let us stand in our bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, Sorry, I'm not just
wife died of miscarriage, he descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of everlasting. Let us pray together our offering and prayer that is found in our bosom. Let us pray, O God, God of the universe, you offer us new beginnings and guide us on our journey. Lead us to your table, nourish us with this heavenly food, and prepare us to carry your love to a hungry world. In the name of Christ our Lord. We begin on page 206. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We give them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praises.